Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Marcy Hamilton, and I am one of the co-conveners of this uh, first ever symposium on athletes and abuse, which, as you know, has become an increasing, increasingly understood pro problem, uh, increasingly in the spotlight. Uh, I have been very fortunate to be able to work with uh, Professor Susan Sorensen and uh, Professor Richard Gellis uh, in uh, making this happen, and we are um, very excited to kick off this morning with Attorney General Josh Shapiro. Uh, he has been a leader and was at the top of my list for people that would talk to us about uh, why this matters so much, why these issues are so important. You know, in 2002, the spotlight story came out about institution-based abuse in the Catholic Church, but the sports stories took a lot longer. And it's only in 2017 that we started to see the institution-based part of the problem. And so I'm here today to welcome you, to thank you for coming, and also I have the great honor and privilege of introducing uh, Attorney General Shapiro. So let me just say briefly, uh, don't get up yet. Uh, th this is a man who has lived up to the promises that he's made on the campaign trail. His priorities have been protecting seniors, implementing a comprehensive integrity agenda to ensure people from across the Commonwealth are heard and have faith in the justice system, directing an aggressive fight against the heroin and opioid ep epidemic, including treatment for those suffering. He was at the forefront of same-sex marriage battles in this state and also has been very active in protecting voting rights and also fighting Wall Street. But he's also doing something that no other attorney general is doing right now, which is conducting a grand jury into six dioceses in the state of Pennsylvania. That is remarkable. Pennsylvania already has more grand jury reports on just sex abuse than any other state in the country. The Solberry School, the Sandusky uh, story, the grand jury reports out of Philly, already three uh, on the Philadelphia Archdiocese. So this is a man who's taking these things seriously and is determined that things do not get buried, which is where all the secrets get, get kept. So without further ado, thank you, Attorney General Shapiro, and please help me in welcoming him. Good morning, everyone. Um, I appreciate uh, the kind introduction. Is, is this going to get messed up if I go like that? No. OK. Oh, it did. I'm sorry. Um, thank you very much for having me here this morning. And um, Professor, I want to just thank you for the kind words and, and for the work that, that you do. I apologize to whomever was in charge of that. It's my fault. Um, and I want to also thank your colleagues, uh, Professor Sorensen and Professor Gellis. And, and not just for having me here today, but for the work that you do each and every day on this topic. And, your willingness uh, to have people come here together uh, and, and share their stories, share their experience, share their research, and most importantly, do your work to break down the stigma that is oftentimes associated with these issues. And in breaking down that stigma, it encourages others to come forward uh, and do the, the things that they need to do uh, in order to heal. I wanna just talk generally about these issues for a few moments, and then I'd really like to take your questions and have the opportunity uh, for a back and forth. I always say that at the beginning so you can think about what you wanna uh, ask and, and we can have a good, robust discussion during our time here together. I mean, I think what is clear, uh, certainly to everybody in this room, and I think becoming more and more evident to the public is that abuse and neglect affect children uh, and athletes of all ages and at all levels of the game. Uh, sports, as was alluded to in the introduction, contains a similar dynamic to politics and business and uh, entertainment. And we know that you know, in that realm, success is often defined by pleasing a very finite or limited number of people. You please that limited number of people, a, a coach, a general manager, or someone in charge of a team, athletic director, then you get the position on the team, you get the position on the court, whatever the case may be. And that dynamic also exists certainly in politics, in entertainment, in business, and so it's important that we consider all of these different uh, things together, even though the disciplines one might use for gymnastics is certainly different than one might use uh, to vote on a bill on the House floor. But regardless, I think the dynamics are very similar. Athletes we know, and certainly we know this from recent exposure, are uh, in very vulnerable positions. And I fundamentally believe that we need to do more to protect them. I think it is critically important that we send a message to athletes that we are listening and that we are willing to listen to them and to believe their truths. And if we demonstrate that, we not only give them the confidence they need to come forward and share their truth, but we make it harder for individuals to abuse them or other athletes, and harder, especially, for that cover-up to be sustained over a long period of time. I want to just applaud the bravery of the athletes who have come forward, at least one of whom I understand you're going to have the privilege of hearing from later today, Dominic Mosciano. Uh, we know that other uh, Olympic medalists and athletes have spoken out. Certainly, 
in the Nasser uh, matter most recently, we know that Allie Raceman and Simone Biles, who I had the pleasure of visiting with not too long ago, Gabby Douglas, Michaela Maroney, and more have come forward. They have accomplished a, a tremendous amount uh, in their athleticism and in their, their particular uh, sport and field. But what they've accomplished by elevating their voices uh, is something that is gonna be felt, I believe, for so much longer, not to take anything away from their athletic accomplishment, but the bravery they demonstrated in standing up and telling their truth is truly something uh, that is inspiring to me and I know will help many others uh, in, in the process. I think it's also important that as we think about these issues and discuss them, typically it is women and young girls who come forward, but men and boys are not immune from this. There are example after example, I'll talk about uh, some later involving the Sandusky matter, but there's example after example, including uh, Theo Fleury, uh, who was an NHL great, who was abused at a young age by his hockey coach. We cannot lose sight of the fact that boys and men are also victims to this, and in some cases, the stigma for them coming forward is oftentimes even greater. I, I always think it's important uh, to try and add some data to the personal stories, because I think the data makes it harder for people to say, oh, well, that's someone else's problem. That only occurs in other cities or in other jurisdictions or in other places. It doesn't happen in my neighborhood. But one of the things I tell people is it does happen in your neighborhood, and it does happen in your church, or your place of worship, or your school, or your university. We know that one in 10 children are gonna be sexually abused before the age of 18. One in five girls. Pennsylvania has two and a half million children. So to put that into some perspective, a quarter of a million kids are going to be sexually abused before they turn 18, right here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, if that data holds. And we have the power to do something about that data. And you're doing that work day in and day out and by gathering here today. But to me, that number is absolutely staggering. Another staggering number is that 20% of abused children will be abused before they turn eight years old. As the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it is hard for me to comprehend that. As a father of four young children around that age, it is, it is something that just pulls at my heart uh, and quite literally makes me sick to think about. We also don't know how many people, how many athletes have yet to come forward. And so it's important that we peel away uh, the, the barriers to people telling their truth, telling their story, and coming forward and making sure that there are people available to listen to their story and resources available uh, to hear them. You know, my office has played, and, and this is a major priority of mine, as was said uh, in the kind introduction, my office has played a, a major role in trying to root out this type of abuse in the field of athletics and in institutions beyond athletics. Uh, the Office of Attorney General here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is one of the lead agencies in the country and certainly here in the state. Uh, we know that we place an enormous trust not only here in Pennsylvania, but across the country, in coaches, in teachers, in professors, in leaders in these institutions, spiritual and otherwise. And we know that it's also almost impossible for us to imagine those people that we trust harming uh, loved ones, harming our kids or someone else's kids. Um, we know that um, we've seen this play out too many times though. The, in the Office of Attorney General, uh, some of the cases you may not be aware of that I think is uh, I important to point out is that we have a child predator unit that is dedicated specifically uh, to focusing on the abuse of children, uh, either people preying on them online or people uh, actually attacking them uh, in person or in their communities. One of the first cases that I had to deal with as Attorney General a little more than a year ago when I took office was a case involving furries. These are adults that dress up in furry costumes. Um, and one father, who was a furry, uh, decided that he would repeatedly bring his then 10-year-old son to furry parties where he was repeatedly and systematically raped by the other uh, men, and in some cases, women, uh, who were at these furry parties. Uh, we arrested all of the individuals associated with that, and many of them will spend a good part of the rest of their lives behind bars. I think about that young boy nearly every day. Uh, in, in ending that ring, that furry predator ring, uh, we know we not only helped that one boy, but we helped others come forward and tell their truth. We know that because we set up a special hotline and got numerous calls of people who had been abused. Today in Johnstown, there is a pediatrician who saw nearly every child in that community. He was the town doctor. His name is Dr. Johnny Bartow, and it's important that you know his name. Dr. Bartow today is behind bars because he couldn't make bail. We arrested him once for sexually abusing one of his patients, a little girl. We arrested him again 
for sexually abusing a young relative of his. He arrested him again for abusing another young relative of his. And stay tuned because there is a lot more that is going to happen to Dr. Johnny Bartow uh, as the days go on. No matter who you are, we will not tolerate you abusing children. So we have these examples of coaches and leaders who were doing this abuse. We have this example of people we never heard of in the case of the Furry case. We have an example of someone who is maybe not someone you've heard of, but larger than life in this small town in Pennsylvania, abusing patients and abusing uh, his own relatives. Think about that. Uh, who would you trust your children with more than your pediatrician or your grandfather or father? Well, in this case, Dr. Bartow violated that. It was alluded to earlier, and though I can't speak about it uh, anymore, my office takes very, very seriously institutional sexual assault, whether it's in the church or somewhere else. And I look forward to having a more fulsome discussion uh, about that work in the future. And then, of course, my office played the leading role in the Sandusky matter, a matter that, yes, involved the abuse of children, but also a matter that I think is important because it sent a clear signal that if you are an administrator in a position of power in an institution and you cover it up, you don't take the steps required of you, you're not only going to lose your job, you're not only going to get shamed in the newspaper or, or publicly, you're going to be held criminally liable. We arrested three administrators, two vice presidents and the president of Penn State University. All three of them were convicted. And of course, Jerry Sandusky was convicted as well. I think we set a new standard legally for what can happen when you try to cover up sexual assault within your institution or institutional sexual assault. We take that very seriously. We also take the safety and well-being of athletes and students on college campuses very seriously. That's why I kicked off uh, an initiative when I took office uh, to do campus safety roundtables, uh, including here in Philadelphia. We did one recently uh, at Drexel nearby, and I know Penn participated in that. Well, we want to make sure that we are student-driven uh, in the outcomes that, that, uh, that we recommend, the recommendations that we have, the steps that we take. I was talking to a student at Bucknell University not too long ago who was describing some of the sexual assault, some of the violence, uh, some of the excessive drinking and drug use that happened on campus. And this was a student um, who said that she wanted to do something about it. She wanted to help the other students get the help that they needed. But she didn't know literally who to call. She was afraid if she called 911, she would get arrested. And she had no idea on campus where students would go to get help. That's at Bucknell University, a university where there were resources, a university where there were numbers posted and, and you know, websites made available. And I know that you have tremendous resources here at Penn as well. But there's a disconnect oftentimes between students understanding where to go for help, whether they're putting themselves in any legal jeopardy by trying to get help for themselves or, or others. And I think we need to address that more head on. And so we've engaged in this process across the Commonwealth, in, including uh, a campus safety roundtable that will be occurring today at the University of Pittsburgh to try and deal with some of the challenges that we face on campus, where we know that 11 percent of all college students experience rape or sexual assault on campus. 23% of them are females. We have five of these discussions going on right now on college campuses that involve student administrators and professors and students and local law enforcement who are working really effectively with us. I've seen too many times politicians swoop into a college campus, uh, make some big pronouncement and leap. I don't think at the end of the day that affects student behavior. I don't think at the end of the day that's particularly helpful to universities. I think it's better when law enforcement shows up and actually listens and finds out what tools are needed, what help is needed, commending a university when they're doing the right thing so that they keep doing the right thing, so that they don't cover up data and other information, but instead uh, you know, reward good behavior and help them correct behavior that we might not consider to be particularly uh, productive. That level of collaboration and listening is very, very key. I think throughout this process, whether it's the Sandusky prosecution, whether it's what happened uh, with Nasser, whether it's the other athletes or uh, people in the entertainment industry or political world who are stepping forward and sharing their truths, a few things have become clear. As adults, we cannot look the other way. We must report what we know. And we have to make sure that when we report it, government and non-governmental organizations and social service agencies are in a position to have the resources to do something about it, to go ahead and make sure that there is help where help is needed. We also need to understand that children cannot be relied on to disclose abuse, particularly right away. So we have to both be encouraging to help them tell their story, 
and also be on the lookout for warning signs. There is so much shame and pain. And I have literally talked to hundreds of child victims across Pennsylvania who have shared their truth with me, who have told me uh, that this is the first time they're telling their story, who have some wanted to hug me and hold me because they felt safe, and others who were so scared to even have a hand on their shoulder to let them know that you're there to care. As adults, as prosecutors, as, as social service uh, agencies, as academics, we have to make sure that we create a safe and loving environment and make it look very different for different people who need to share their stories so that they're able to come forward. We know, and, and again, I look forward to coming back and talking with you uh, a little bit more when I'm able to, but we know that 73% of young people don't tell their truth within their first year, and 45% of them don't disclose it within five years. It's one of the reasons why we need to change the laws in this Commonwealth, so that no matter when you come forward and share your truth, the perpetrator is able to be held criminally responsible, and the victims are able to be made as whole as possible uh, in the future through civil remedies. Parents need to be on the lookout and understand the different warning signs. Uh, we need to make sure that they see the signs uh, of abuse, when they act out sexually, when they act out uh, leaning on drugs and, and alcohol uh, at a young age. That is not always an indicator of abuse, but it is oftentimes something that will lead us toward uh, knowing that that is something that occurred. And most importantly, when children do disclose, they have to know that we believe them. And they have to know that we're gonna get them the help that they need. And oftentimes, they need to know that the perpetrator is going to be singled out. People are gonna know their name, and they're gonna know where that abuse occurred. So often, that is the healing that these abuse, that is the beginning of the healing process for these victims. We know that 90% of children know the perpetrator uh, who inflicted the sexual abuse on them. This isn't about so-called stranger danger. These kids, these athletes, these parishioners know who it is that is doing the abuse. And it's important that we listen to them. And I think each of us in this room has a responsibility that when we listen, to help eliminate the stigma surrounding coming forward. Now, one of the interesting dynamics that we have found, and I can speak openly about this one particular case, but in a clergy sex abuse case in the Johnstown Altoona area, which is out in western Pennsylvania. And then later, when I arrested a priest uh, in Westmoreland County, also in the western part of the state, I set up a special hotline in each situation. And I thought initially that the calls we would receive would primarily be calls associated with that particular priest that we had just arrested. In some cases, the calls were about that. But the vast majority of calls we received were actually other victims, not in that area, not who had gone to that church. In some cases, not who were even Catholic. But they had been abused at the hands of some other person that they trusted, a teacher, a coach, someone they looked up to in their community. And they felt strength because others had come forward and been listened to and prosecutors were prosecuting the perpetrators that they then wanted to come forward and tell their stories, to tell their truth. In some cases, we're able to track that down and file criminal charges. But again, because of the way our laws are structured in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania today, uh, in some cases, those individuals were out of reach of the law, either criminal law or civil remedies. That needs to change. Anyone who sexually abuses a child should never be out of the reach of the law here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We also know that if we don't do a better job now, that we are going to continue to allow this cycle of abuse to occur. Between f about 60% of juvenile sex offenders were of course victims themselves. We know that oftentimes when you're victimized, you victimize others, you're abusive to others, in addition to all the challenges that you face internally and personally. So we have a responsibility not just to the victims today, but stopping the prospect of there being victims tomorrow. That's why our work needs to happen now. We, of course, know that uh, abuse victims today uh, have higher incidence of suicide and alcohol and drug use and the effects of PTSD. And so we have to make sure that they're looked after and the next generation is looked after. Look, I want you to know that the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office places an incredible, incredibly high priority on the welfare of the children here in Pennsylvania. Whether it's one child 
who is abused at the hand of one relative, or scores of children abused at the hands of their coach, or their priest, or some leader of an institution. No one is off limits. We apply the law without fear and without favor. No one is above the law. No one is out of reach of the law. And we are going to continue to do our part. But I'm also mindful of the fact that, you know, Scripture teaches us that no one is required to complete the task, but neither are we free to refrain from it. I take that to mean that we have a responsibility as human beings to get off the sidelines, get in the game, and do our part. We can do our parts as prosecutors. You can do your parts as academics to do the research and to make sure people are aware of the trauma that exists. Survivors can do their part by telling stories to others that will empower them to come forward. But we each have to do our part. We're doing our best in the Office of Attorney General. I know you're doing your best. Individually, I appreciate the good work that Penn is doing, and I very much appreciate uh, you being here this morning uh, for this discussion. With that, I'd be more than happy uh, to answer your questions. Thank you very much. First one's always the hardest. Yes, go ahead. I was going to say first one's the hardest. Not at Penn. I guess everybody has a question. I didn't hear you. Pen Pennsylvania Supreme Court, uh, regressive. Regressive. Yeah, when it comes to your technical in the judicial system. Uh, and I think that we know, for instance, you talked about the statute of limitations issue. Uh, and you know, that's a huge problem for the agency that's going to come forward. Uh, but also, um, the, the lawyers that I work with who are for the collection process in front of the father, their teacher, or their teacher. Um, and we expect and we expect them to be able to successfully do that. Um, and I've seen all, far too many kids become suicidal in the face of having to do that. Um, many states allow videotape recordings and other such things. Um, that's very hard to do here. And I want to ask you about how we can change that. Because yeah. that is not a victim-friendly approach. No, we, we certainly need to do better by victims, making it easier, um, more comfortable. And comfortable is maybe not the, the, the best word, but I hope you, you understand what I mean by that, to allow victims uh, to tell their truth. Look. The beginning of that process in many communities in Pennsylvania is one where you are immediately contacted by police. And then you have to go to a hospital. And then you have to speak to counselors. And you, you have this trauma, and then you're forced to relive this trauma over and over and over again in an absolutely disjointed fashion. Many of us, more than a decade ago, realized that this was a model that couldn't work. And so we started something called Child Advocacy Centers. We have a terrific one that I helped started in my home county of Montgomery County called Mission Kids. And I've been on a mission to go and expand these all throughout Pennsylvania so that every young person has access. That's a place where if you've been the victim of abuse, you can come and you can meet in one safe, secure place that doesn't look like a jail and doesn't feel like a hospital. Um, it is a much more warm and welcoming environment where you can talk to counselors and you can be interviewed by law enforcement. You can be in a safe environment. And while it's difficult to talk about, uh, you're not reliving the trauma the way you would in, in another way. That's an example of where we've gotten it right in Pennsylvania. We have to do more of that. Uh, Sandusky was an important step in the right direction uh, when it comes to institutional sexual assault, making sure that institutions and the leaders of those institutions are held accountable. Uh, the work that we are doing uh, right now in the Catholic Church, which again, I, I can't talk about any more than just the fact that we're doing it, uh, is something that I think will be uh, quite groundbreaking. And that will have an effect. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure that uh, the young people, uh, as they go through the legal process, can do so in a, in a more comfortable manner. I'm reminded, I, I spoke about this furry case uh, at, at the outset. Um, most of the people involved in that ring are going to spend, the vast majority of those people are going to spend uh, the vast majority of their lives behind bars. Uh, one individual who went to trial uh, actually won. And I uh, wasn't in the courtroom. But when that news was shared with me late on a Friday evening, when the jury returned a not guilty verdict, um, I was quite literally in tears. Uh, my kids didn't know, they thought I was, you know, bizarro dad, which they think I am usually. But um, one of the things, though, that actually helped me heal 
was when that young victim said to me, um, it's okay, I got to tell my story. And the judge listened. And all of these official people listened. And I got to tell my story. I still wish that person uh, was gonna spend the rest of his life behind bars. But in some ways we gave that victim, I mean literally his day in court and the opportunity to speak his truth. So we have to find ways to do that that, um, that are gonna allow us to, to you know, have the victims do it in a way that they feel more comfortable with. Uh, we're making some progress in, in Pennsylvania Child Advocacy Centers being a great example. We do a lot more work to do. Yes, ma'am. So many times we find out that um, it is um, you know, 10 years, 15 years before someone is brave enough to come forward to talk about this. And they don't know, I don't think that they know where to go. You know, so it's one thing with Mission Kids, and I've worked with you on that project, and it's really extraordinary, the work that's done um, when a child has been abused kind of in real time. Yeah. Um, but when you have an older person, an older adult, you know, where do they go? And how can um, perhaps the state of Pennsylvania work at finding a, or creating some kind of advo advocacy place for them to be able to tell their story and to be taken seriously. Yeah, that, that, that's a phenomenal point. You're right. I mean, we've, we've done, a, I think, a terrific job through child advocacy centers of making sure young people know uh, where they can go, where they can be brought to. But certainly, um, as you, you keep your truth uh, inside for years and years and years, a lot of times it's 40 and 50 and 60-year-old men who are, for the first time, talking about what happened to them uh, when they were younger, certainly women as well. But uh, there are many stories on my mind right now of men in, in that situation. And we don't have the best resources uh, for them. The one great resource, for example, in Pennsylvania is PCAR, Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. But oftentimes people view that as a place where women go, not men. Uh, and that's not a shot at PCAR, but it's, it's the reality of, I think, the way a lot of people think about that. Uh, certainly we need more and better resources in Pennsylvania. I am constantly out there advocating for more money uh, and, and you know, more, more treatment facilities, more counselors uh, for that. It is imperative. Uh, that as more and more people are feeling comfortable telling their truth, that we have places uh, for them to be able to go and, and, and get the help that they need. I agree with you on that. Okay. Um, law enforcement by its nature, I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. Law enforcement by its nature is reactive and punishment is appropriate and therapy is good post fact. But in terms of athletics and children, what can be done proactively to help parents coaching organizations, because you know you get a bad coach and a good organization, and, and children to stop the abuse from happening before it sure. happens. Well, yeah, look, obviously by definition we are, we are reactive, right? We are reacting to a situation, we're holding someone criminally liable, or uh, my case of, my, my office of course has civil remedies as well uh, available to us in, in certain cases. But I do think that there is a proactive effect of what we do. Uh, we can call for change in laws that ultimately makes it uh, harder for people to abuse children. We can continue to hold leaders accountable for their role in sexually abusing student athletes or children, which then gives others uh, the, the, the confidence in coming forward and knowing that their truth won't fall on deaf ears. But make no mistake, we are one piece of the puzzle. Uh, academics need to do their part. Uh, counselors need to be available. Government needs to fund this. You know, government can't walk away from its responsibilities, whether it's the city of Philadelphia, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, or this nation. They have to make sure the funding is available for them. There are some new uh, laws that were put in place in the wake of Sandusky when it comes to athletics, particular coaches who need to go through background checks, and we probably need to tweak that a little bit to make sure that um, you know, we're, we're allowing for people to participate in that process and not shut off from that process who shouldn't be shut off from it. Uh, un helping children understand that if you see something, say something. That that exists not just you know whether it's violence uh, in, in a school or one of their friends acting out, but also uh, if a coach does something inappropriate. I think coaches uh, growing up in, in in this era with what we know now and the things we've exposed now, being more mindful uh, of how they allow them, what situations they allow themselves to be in, and, and where parents taking a more active approach to their their kids' athletics and, and the the. Uh, you know, the time they spend there with coaches, trainers, et cetera. I think all those things fit together. I'm not here telling you that it's a law enforcement only solution. And I do agree, you know, in part with the statement you made that we are reactive to situations that occur. But I think in being reactive, if we are aggressively going after this, which my office is, there is an effect of stopping this from occurring, maybe not because there are fewer sick individuals out there or fewer, you know, individuals out there who might be more prone to this type of criminal conduct but more children uh, who are gonna raise their hand and say, well, wait, that happened to me. 
and stop it from happening to another child. The more parents who have more of a keen eye on what's going on who are going to uh, not put their, their kids in that situation and make sure that those individuals are never hired as coaches or if they are, uh, they're dismissed before an abusive uh, situation can occur. Am I getting the hook here? Thank you all uh, very much. It, it really, I, I can't tell you enough. Um, I know you have a full day ahead of you, but just um, how serious we take this, how emotional these issues are to me. Um, and you know, when I think about the things that, that keep me up at night, literally wake me up at night, uh, it's the abuse of children and the cases we have involving kids um, that keep me up at night. And I'm doing everything in my power to do something about it. And um, I appreciate the work you're all doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.